start. <laughs> I always like to start on time. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome, all our members um, and anybody from uh, Clarisdale joining us on Zoom. And welcome to uh, any guests who are joining us on, uh, on YouTube. Um, you've obviously found your way here, which is a good thing. If you want to find out more about us, <clears throat> you're welcome to, uh, to look on our site, uh, on our website. Um, you can follow us on uh, Facebook, um, on Twitter, and you can see recordings of all of our talks during lockdown on our YouTube uh, channel. And you can find that uh, again on our website. There's Matt. And could we, um, could we welcome two new members um, in the usual way, please? Um, Angela and Arthur. I hope you're joining us tonight. If not, uh, you, can, <laughs> you can see this welcome on YouTube. Um, this brings our membership to 129. We continue to, uh, to gain new members, uh, which is great. However, our secretary, our treasurer reminded me that um, some subs are still due. <laughs> so if, uh, if you're one of those people and you want to pay by direct transfer or send him a check, Alan will be delighted. All the details on how to do that, if you're not already aware, again, on our website. Thanks, Matt. The technology is working slowly. And just uh, <clears throat> a reminder about what's coming up. Um, on the 4th of December, we have a talk by uh, Professor William uh, Chaplin on astro seismology and exoplanets. So that sounds uh, will be really good fun. And uh, there'll be a sky in December. Not a normal sky in December. This one will be slightly different. Uh, on the 9th of December, there's the imaging group, uh, the imaging and observing group, in fact. And that's for members only. Uh, as is on the 11th of December, our Christmas pub quiz. Uh, you're all welcome to join there and uh, bring your own drinks along. On the 18th of December, we've got uh, step three of our four steps to the stars program. Last year, it was in, real, in the real world. This year, it's in the virtual world. And Alan will be talking about navigating the night sky. Uh, this is really focused on, uh, on beginners as an introductory guide to, to finding your way, your way around. And on the 8th of January, we've got the fastest eye on the sky. Uh, it's about the Vera Rubin Observatory with uh, Aaron Rudman from Stanford University. And the sky in January, which will be more of our normal sky in January uh, uh, transmissions. So tonight... Um, we have um, uh, Dr. Rebecca Higgett who's going to talk to us, uh, but firstly, uh, Andy, uh, our honorary president, is going to talk us, uh, uh, deliver a short introduction. Over to you, Andy. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm, I'm only going to say a few words. Um, you'll be glad to hear, Rebecca. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, I think um, the series of online talks, the online meetings that the society has started since um, lockdown has been very successful in general. I, so I think we all agree with, with that. Uh, and um, in particular, um, as well as um, talks about forefront science from uh, you know, really high profile guest speakers and talks about observing techniques from society members yeah, the sort of thing that you expect any astronomy society uh, to, to do. Uh, we've had a series of talks uh, about the history of astronomy, uh, which have all been really fascinating. Uh, now, mostly these have been either from society members or other um, local uh, amateur historians of one kind or another, um, in, in, including some of ambiguous status, shall we say, he said, thinking of Bruce Vickery. But... Um, uh, and, and, and I think, you know, that I think of myself as an extremely amateur historian. You know, it's fun, but that's not my, my day job. But tonight we're really lucky because we've got the real thing. We are having a, a talk from a proper historian of science. And in fact, one of the best known historians of science um, in the UK. Uh, so Rebecca has had a, a, a glittering career. She's moved all over the place. She's um, worked in, uh, in Durham, uh, Imperial College, 
the University of Kent, uh, the National Maritime Museum. Uh, and uh, for quite some time, she was a, a blogger on the, the Guardian. Uh, so some of you might know her from there. You don't do that anymore, I think, Rebecca. There we go. Um, but now we're all very pleased because we've stolen her back to Edinburgh, uh, where she is uh, Principal Curator of Science at the National Museum. Um, now, I, um, although I knew her by reputation, I didn't know Rebecca personally until uh, last year uh, because she was one of our co-conspirers in the um, week-long, uh, week-long, year-long, well, sometimes I wish it was only a week, the year-long uh, Piazzi Smythe celebrations, which, of course, this society was deeply involved in and supported as well. Uh, and in particular, um, Rebecca led the organisation of the Piazzi Smythe Symposium, uh, which many members of the society attended. And a, a, you know, a, a really fascinating event uh, uh, that, that was. So um, uh, I was very grateful to her for that. And it was really fun working with Rebecca. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I know she does fascinating stuff, but tonight she's not gonna tell us about Piazzi Smythe or Thomas Henderson or any of those mega famous people. We're gonna get the intriguing story of John Walter Nickel. And um, uh, I know almost nothing about him. So I'm really looking forward to this. And I'm now going to shut up and hand over to Rebecca. OK, if you'll just share your screen then, Rebecca. And in the meantime, let me just remind people, if you're on Zoom, um, put your questions on the chat line. and Peter will call uh, you to ask. If you're on YouTube, if you put them in the comments section, then Mark will pick them up and ask them on your behalf. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can see my slides and hear me as well. Um, we can. Good, thank you. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Andy. That's a, a lot to live up to. And I'm wondering if, if I have been a, a truly professional historian while putting this together, um, because I've had to do it, obviously, while working from home with um, the archives that I might want to go to um, shut. Uh, so this has been something of an exercise of, of what can you do with online resources and um, with Google, which has been a good help to me, Google Maps and Google Books. Um, which, which has been interesting. It has um, brought all sorts of things up and um, it's also been a bit of a speculative talk. I, I'm kind of bridging my sort of institutional move that I've done um, this year, um, sort of working with some materials that I knew um, while I was um, both at uh, Greenwich and at the University of um, Kent. Uh, which include these wonderful caricatures. Well, here's one of them, um, and you'll see many more um, as the, the talk goes on. So if nothing else, I'm going to show you lots of fun pictures, um, which I think is suitable for a Friday night. Um, so these um, images um, were digitised. Um, I had funding from the British Society of the History of Science um, and from the University of Kent to do a digitisation of some of this material and also some of the uh, Royal Greenwich, sorry, the, um, yeah, uh, the Greenwich Observatory archives as well, and um, they're online at Cambridge Digital Library. So that was a great place to start from um, while working from home. Um, and um, I thought this would be um, a good thing to come back to because I knew that there was a Scotsman on this um, particular expedition um, that these caricatures come from, which was 1874 Transit of Venus expedition to um, Hawaii, uh, to Honolulu in particular. And um, I knew nothing about him either. I didn't know if I would be able to find out anymore, um, but I have, and I hope it's um, revealing of um, the kinds of contexts, um, the networks that can create a career or encourage someone to take up a career in astronomy in the 19th century. And it's helped me learn quite a bit about um, Edinburgh at this period, um, the institutions, the place of mathematics, um, science, education um, there in the first half of the 19th century. And there also turns out to be quite a bit of a family story. I'll be interested to know how well Nicol is known at all um, by, by people here. Um, he, he's not generally known to historians of astronomy beyond the fact that he is one of the people who was on that expedition. And so his name comes up um, from that. So I, I hope this will be um, enlightening. Um, these um, albums in general have been wonderful sources to work with. They're quite unusual as um, historical sources and they've been something that I've had to think quite hard about how to, to use as sources because they're obviously not not straightforward in what they tell us, but they do certainly give a sense of personality in a way that um, official archives often don't. 
um, and a different sort of view of the experience. Um, so this um, one on my title slide um, shows our man, um, John Walter Nicholl, um, on the very day of the transit of Venus, 8th of December, 1874, um, watching and um, the, the little line at the bottom is a quote directly from a newspaper account um, of that. Um, but what was a very heroic account becomes mock heroic in this context. It says that Mr. Nicol watches the disc of the great luminary through his telescope and exclaims, good gracious, something had happened. Um, anyway, and we know he's a Scot, um, the, the artist here is, is very keen to let his audience know that. So the official account um, of the uh, transit of Venus, um, my slides are not changing, just let me, let's see if I can, there we go, um, is, is this one, which was published in um, 1881, um, the last sort of very significant work that um, George Airy, the Astronomer Royal um, at Greenwich had his name to, um, and came out just before he retired. And of course, before it all began again for the 1882 transit of Venus expeditions. Um, so this includes um, all five British expeditions um, that were reported on, had remarks from many of the observers, including Nicol, um, and their observations were brought together, reduced, compared. Um, I'm not going to stop to say um, what a transit of Venus is. I, suspect, I assume that this audience is very, very familiar with transit of Venus, so I, I shan't do that bit of spiel. Um, but to remind ourselves that this is not only an event that was um, about astronomy um, and, and the interest of that, but also one that is about um, government state interest in astronomy because of its connections to navigation, because of that being seen as an underpinning for trade, for, for the nation, for, for empire. It's competitive too. Um, there are all the different nations um, going out to, to make these observations. They're being seen um, to act effectively, scientifically um, in far spread parts of the world. Um, and the view that we get from the drawings that I'm going to show you is one that is, although Hawaii is not part of the British Empire, it's certainly a, an imperial kind of eye that we get. Um, so the um, Hawaiian or Sandwich Islands um, was really the, the chief one, I think, of the expeditions. Um, it had two substations as well as the Honolulu main station, um, and it was led by Captain George Lyon Tupman, um, who was an army officer um, and uh, an amateur, uh, amateur astronomer who um, organised all of the expeditions. He was the sort of um, man brought in by Airy to, to deal with the organizational efforts, to oversee the training of all of the observers um, that went overseas, um, which are called in, in this um, text, an efficient body of observers from all classes, naval, military, and civilian. Tutman was the individual to whom the albums of caricatures that I'm gonna be drawing on here um, were given. So he was the dedicatee of them. He features very prominently in them. And it's a family descendant um, of his, Charlotte Tupman, who owns them today and who gave permission for them to be digitized. Um, so the personnel um, of the Honolulu expedition um, under Tupman, um, you can see um, from this excerpt here, we've got Lieutenant Ramsden from the Navy. He was um, the photographer. We have Lieutenant um, uh, Edward Noble from the Royal Military Art Artillery, um, I say Royal Marine Artillery, sorry, um, which is what, what Tutman was as well. Um, and he was the artist, so Noble is the man who, who did the drawings. Um, we also have um, J.W. Nicol Esquire, um, and we see um, from this that he was a fellow of the Astronom Royal Astronomical Society and that he had formerly been an assistant at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. Um, if we follow the um, asterisk down also, we see the sad part of the story, which was that Nicol died in November 1878. So just under four years um, after the expedition, um, he had died and before this text came out, although he'd certainly been important um, in producing it, or, or one of many people who was. Um, so it's from accounts of this expedition, of course, that Nicol appears in the history of astronomy at all. Um, and um, so I'll give a sense of his role in it uh, before taking us back to Edinburgh and then forward on again. 
So we can follow um, the path of Nicol and the other observers um, through the journals that um, Tupman kept first at Greenwich, um, where the observers um, and instruments were all assembled um, before so that they could begin training um, and organizing um, the travel. Then he continued keeping them as they went overseas and then came back to Greenwich again. Um, so these journals have also been digitized and, and are available freely on um, Cambridge Digital Library. Um, you probably can't see it terribly well on your screens, but from um, the bit I've exerted here, you might just be able to see an underlining that says Nickel commenced work. So that was on the 13th of November, 1873. Um, and it notes the, here that he was initially assigned to Station C, uh, which was a different one. Um, Station B was the Honolulu one. Um, so he was originally supposed to be going to Rodriguez Island, um, east of Mauritius. Uh, but he's changed. I haven't um, located the, the moment that that decision was made to change him, but um, my, I suspect that Tupman decided that he wanted to um, bring Nicol with him, to have Nicol as part of his expedition, um, either or both because he was a, a good observer and mathematician for the reductions, um, or as well because he was good company, the kind of person you might want to have around while you're sort of intensely together as a group of individuals um, working on an expedition like that. The journals um, list him elsewhere, um, often they appear by initials, and he's um, down as WN. So we know that he was known as Walter, um, he sometimes appears elsewhere as J. Walter Nicol, um, and so that was evidently the, the name he went by, which was also his father's name, um, and we'll meet his father in due course. These um, journals show that um, Nicol had soon um, examined and got through all the books that he was given on his arrival to sort of get him up to speed. Um, and that he'd commence working with the model. Um, so that's what's in the image there. It's the, the model that was meant to simulate what it looked like to see um, the disk of um, Venus crossing over the sun. Um, and it moved, as you can see, there's a, a regulator there to move it across at the appropriate time. And all of the observers trained again and again and again with that while they're in Greenwich um, and beyond um, in order to try and prepare themselves um, for the crucial moments and the crucial timings that they had. By December 1873, Nicol was learning um, to work with the particular instruments, um, the transit instrument and also in particular the altazimuth, um, which he was taking apart in order to learn all its different parts. He was learning to adjust the microscopes and the levels, clearly one of the more complicated instruments to work with. Um, he sailed out um, overseas on 17th of June 1874. So the training period at Greenwich was, was fairly lengthy. Station B, um, the Sandwich Islands expedition, went out in two groups and they met up in Valparaiso before then traveling on together to Honolulu. Um, this is uh, another sheet of the caricatures. Um, Noble's images give um, a, a lovely flavor of the processes of traveling. We can see the discomforts of sea travel and the difficulties, the challenges of traveling with really huge amounts of equipment that they took with them. You've got you know, both very delicate instrumentation, micrometers and so on, and also hugely heavy mounts and piers that, that are going with them on board ship. Um, at the top of this image, um, he's showing the moment when they met up the two different parties um, in Valparaiso. Um, he talks about the meeting of the chiefs um, there, and those are the two sort of leaders of the subgroups. Um, there's Tupman um, on the left and George Forbes, um, who was professor of natural philosophy at Anderson's College in Glasgow. Um, and he led one of the sub um, expeditions, um, one of the other um, observing sites in Sandwich Islands. Uh, and he was in charge when traveling of the three individuals behind him, um, who include Noble um, at the back. Um, there is an army man, a naval man and a civilian there. Um, and all four of them, um, Forbes and those other three, were about 25 um, on this expedition. And, and you can often see them sort of behaving like young men um, on their travels. On the other side are an Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman. Um, all of them were over 30, so they were a slightly older group here. We've got um, Tupman at the front, then Richard Johnson behind, um, who taught experimental philosophy at Trinity College Dublin. And then at the back there is Nicol with his pipe and possibly something like a tam shanter on his head. Um, so here they are um, in a photograph in um, more tropical gear. Um, they're sitting by the stage that had the um, model on it when it was set up at Honolulu. So they continued their practicing with the model um, even when they were overseas. 
um, see them slightly closer up there. Um, Nickel, we can see and, and generally recognize on the far left there by his balding head, um, and he appears with that throughout um, the caricatures. So from the official account, um, the published account, we know that in October 1874, Nicol uh, and Tuckman, um, who's sitting at the front um, with the sort of pointy beard and glasses and um, sort of straw hat, I suppose. Um, and um, they, they were working together um, to make um, observations of the zenith distances of the moon's upper and lower limbs in order to establish local longitude, something that of course was absolutely essential for um, the, the accuracy of their um, observations and the calculations of solar parallax and for making any kind of valid comparison with the other expeditions that were going on. On the 4th of November, Nicol um, went out on a bit of an expedition with CJ Lyons, who was the Hawaiian government surveyor. And at the time that this was happening, um, the uh, Hawaiian survey was um, going on and they were triangulating um, the island of Oahu, Oahu um, where Honolulu is. Um, so they fed into that sort of um, broader survey mapping effort as well. Um, and they went with I quote, a party of native workmen um, climbing over 1500 feet to erect a meridian mark um, in order to um, collimate the, the transit instrument um, on the crest of a hill. That moment was recorded by uh, Noble in his caricatures in, in a fashion that reminds me if, if anyone's seen it um, on Twitter, the hashtag overly honest methods, which is possibly what's going on here. Um, so we have a, a, an image that says the party that set the meridian mark up as viewed through a telescope, we get rather mixed as to which is our right and our left. And we can imagine looking upside down and trying to, trying to align things. Uh, each of the expeditions, the British expeditions that were sent overseas, um, had um, a six inch equatorial by Thomas Cook and Sons. So they were trying to make the instrumentation as similar as possible, um, although some of them were bought and some of them were like this one, um, acquired second hand. And this was the instrument that Nicol was assigned to um, on, on the day of the transit. Um, and so same instrument um, here from Noble's caricature. Um, rather different kind of image. Um, this is from the Illustrated London News and it, it's their version of what the Honolulu team looked like um, on the day of the transit itself. And we have Tupman, Nicol, Noble and Ramsden um, and another uh, local individual um, all at their posts awaiting first contact on the 8th of December. And they had um, ideal conditions unlike some of the other expeditions um, despite there having been days of rain um, beforehand. So they, they were very pleased with that. Nicol um, observed internal contact with the, the six inch equatorial, sorry, external, I think that should be, um, that one there, if you can see my cursor, um, making uh, micrometric measurements uh, and then swapped with Tupman, who I, I assume is here with his um, four and a half inch equatorial um, and made um, some observations there to, or the intention was to observe the diameter of the planet um, when it was uh, on the sun. In his report that's in the published account, Nicol was always comparing what he saw with the experience of having observed the model um, of the transit, um, which is what they've been trained to do. But it turns out that this led to something of a false sense of security about the timing um, or what the thing would actually look like, meaning that he thought that he would have plenty of time to switch eyepieces in order to make a different kind of measurement. But he found, to my astonishment, it was that good gracious moment, um, he found that he seemed to have missed the crucial moment of internal contact because he found he could see a completion of light around the planet. He continued to look, but he said, could see no instantaneous phenomena of contact, no black drop, nor anything resembling the model. It didn't look like what he was expecting. He was disappointed. He said, I cannot say that the time as noted is at all satisfactory. Although he concluded that what he was probably seeing was um, an image of the corona um, around Venus uh, rather than the sun's limb, but he regretted his decision to have taken his eye off it and changed the side piece um, so that he couldn't see how the whole thing had um, continued. Noble um, sitting, I think over here was likewise um, astonished when the timing anticipated by the model observations also led him to apparently missing the moment of internal contact. Ramsden's photographs um, working down here were also less than satisfactory. And all of the observers found that despite the training or perhaps because of the way that they had trained, they were actually caught out by what they saw. 
Perhaps in the end more satisfactory was the care with which the expedition had established um, the longitudes of the three different observing stations, um, the Honolulu and the substations at Kailua and Waimea. Um, and so they, they had obviously done that all by observation on each of those, and then they connected the three of them um, by chronometer. All of this feeding into that government um, triangulation survey and also into the, the larger transit of Venus effort um, across the world. So there was an awful lot of effort expended on that and, and they reported it with great satisfaction. Um, so for making the connections between the observing stations, they used portable chronometers, and this is Noble's version of what they were doing. Um, they checked their portable chronometers against regulators, then carried them by boat to ship, compared them with chronometers on board the ships, sailed to the other stations, then carried them ashore, compared them with the transit clocks there. Um, and so on. And when Tutman reports this, he says, every one of these operations was performed personally by Mr. Nickel or by myself. So he was clearly putting Nickel in a position of significant trust there. Um, Nickel or he, equally good in terms of seeing, um, you know, how well done this process was. Um, so here they are in, in the caricature, apparently having cleared Honolulu of its chronometers. They borrowed as many as they could possibly find um, and, and took them on, on board. Um, it says in the report that they slowly carried them by hand um, and never placed them in a vehicle. So I don't know if the uh, wheelbarrow was, was actually used or if again, this is um, Noble having a, a slight joke um, at their expense. Um, so uh, let's go back to Edinburgh. Where had Nicol come from? How had he developed the kind of interest that brought him here to Honolulu and the skills that he evidently have? Um, what prompted him to, to join the expedition um, and, and how did he end up being someone in, in this position of, of trust by the, the leading figure really in these expeditions. So if the main um, source for Nicol as an astronomer is the account of the 1874 expeditions um, and now also that they're available, the caricatures by Noble, um, the other main source is this short obituary that was written um, when he died in 1878 um, for the Royal Astronomical Society and in their memoirs. He'd become um, a fellow really just before leaving on the expedition. So many of the observers, particularly the, the, the civilian rather than the military ones, had become fellows at this stage. Um, and it also gives us some, some basic biographical detail, which is what gave me the, the prompts to begin investigating. And also I was then able to fill them in with some other sources. So it tells us about his father, Walter Nicol, um, who, as it says at the top here, was Doctor of Laws, Teacher of Mathematics in the high school um, at Edinburgh. Um, he was a Doctor of Laws, I think, as an honorary degree, suggesting that he was um, in quite high reputation um, at the university. And here's an image of um, the old college building now and um, South Bridge. Uh, the 1841 census um, tells us that the Nicol family, um, before John Walter Nicol's birth, um, was based um, just very close to here. So just over the other side of Chamber Street at 86 South Bridge. Um, and just down from the university's building, um, there was the father Walter, mother Elizabeth, and children William and Mary, so older siblings to John Walter, um, and a servant as well. Later, post office directories tell us that Walter Nicol was advertising himself here as a teacher, a private teacher of mathematics at this address, um, although by the 1850s, the family were actually living elsewhere um, on Queen Street. So um, Walter Nicol was doing fairly well um, with his business. They were living somewhere nice. He had a business premises and close to the university and, and evidently um, managing to get in a good number of pupils. So we have a, an instant idea of where um, our Walter Nicol got his interest and abilities in mathematics from. Um, but it was interesting to follow um, Walter's career um, and see you know, what kind of a place Edinburgh was for mathematicians at this time. Um, in his early 20s, um, he's, I picked him up as um, a writing master at George Heriot's Hospital School um, starting in 1810. Um, so he, he began not as a, a master of mathematics because they didn't actually have one. He was teaching arithmetic as well as writing and then shortly afterwards became the very first master of mathematics that they had at the school. So it's quite early days for that kind of curricula in a general school like that, where it's not you know, designed particularly for naval or military training or something like that. 
a history of the school quotes from some later testimonials to his abilities as a teacher, um, it is claimed that it was the success which attended Mr. Nichols' voluntary labours with his pupils, which induced the governors to nominate a teacher solely for the scientific department of mathematics, so not just arithmetic, but doing more than that. He said he had a geometry class consisting of 40 pupils. Before quitting the hospital in 1813, he proved that a boy of 12 possessed of fair talents may advantageously be initiated in the study of the elements of geometry. So he proved his point, apparently. He also briefly taught at the high school, as was mentioned in the obituary, um, just around in 1828 to 9. And again, he was the very first uh, master of mathematics that was appointed there. Um, and they had decided that they needed a dedicated mathematics teacher and they turned to him as someone who's recognized as an admirable and an eminent teacher in town. So again, he's, he's bringing um, something new to the curriculum and this is in a sense a key moment for that kind of education um, going on. Um, he found though, he said, um, the work less compatible with his other, gauge, other engagements than he could previously have anticipated, um, presumably meaning that he had plenty of, of more lucrative private teaching um, to work with rather than um, staying within the school. Quite remarkably, I think, um, some of Walter Nichols' papers have survived at um, the Edinburgh City Archives. Um, these remain shut this year and I haven't been able to go in, but I'm grateful to one of the archivists for having sent me a couple of pictures. Um, so I haven't actually been able to go into these piles, but from, from what I can see, um, we see that um, Walter was active in the Edinburgh Society of Teachers. So he's very much identifying himself with um, the sort of teaching educational workforce of Edinburgh. Um, and also um, there's uh, on the other side, um, you may be able to see a, a lecture in natural philosophy from 1808, which I think is probably his own attendance at lectures, probably at the university, um, rather than his own lectures that he was giving. Um, this was part of his own education. Um, he had um, certainly some pupils um, connected with or became connected with the university, um, some who became uh, eminent. One of them was John, Halton, John Hutton Balfour, who became professor of botany at Glasgow and then at Edinburgh. And his name, um, on, hooray for Google Books, um, Halton Nichols' name often appears in printed testimonials for individuals when they were applying for positions at Edinburgh schools or universities. And there are several examples of this right through from the 1820s to the 1850s. So his name was clearly in good repute and he was someone who was a good referee to have on your side. But it's not just about the university um, and sort of more scholarly scientific worlds. Um, he also taught individuals um, mathematics uh, for more business purposes. Um, there is a, an account, a, a memoir by the um, papermaker and politician Charles Cowan, who recalled uh, Walter Nicol as an admirable teacher and greatly beloved by his numerous pupils. But he certainly, Walter Nicol was well known um, in, in other parts uh, of um, the sort of scholarly world of Edinburgh. He was a fellow, for example, of the Society of Antiquaries um, of Scotland from 1830. Uh, so this puts our Nicol in a sort of a good position, I guess, in terms of um, being connected, um, or you would, you would think it would. Um, we know from two different obituaries that Walter Nicol chose to send his sons, William and John Walter, to the um, Edinburgh Institution for Languages and Mathematics, which was here um, in Hill Street, thank you Google Maps, um, very close to the um, family home in Queen Street, so just behind that, um, or just to the north. Um, and it's perhaps not surprising that this um, new institution was where he decided to send his sons. It was, um, as its title suggests, um, founded um, in order to focus on what we consider these very modern subjects like mathematics, natural philosophy, modern languages and so on, um, over the much more traditional um, classics and, and theology. Um, although William, the older son, um, while he was there, won prizes for Latin and Greek, so they were certainly doing those as well. They also had other family connections. Um, Walter Nichols' cousin, um, George Murray, was in charge of the mathematics in all their departments um, at the school. So um, he may have taken a particular interest um, in these boys' education. We might expect them to have scientific interests. We might expect them to not have a choice about having scientific interests, and they certainly seem to have done. William Nichol, the oldest boy, was said to have, from his earliest youth, evinced a desire for scientific knowledge. Perhaps in part because, um, as it was said, he had received from his father encouragement in the prosecution of science. 
He had gone on to study medicine at the university from 1850, and he had won more prizes um, with that, and also discovered his real passion for botany, um, adding um, many species of mosses to the flora of Scotland. Professor Balfour, his father's former student, um, was um, then professor of botany at Edinburgh and Regis Keeper of the Botanical Gardens. And he knew um, William through the Botanical Society of Edinburgh, um, which he was on the council for at one point, and he contributed to their transactions a number of times. Balfour noted um, William's remarkable desire to excel in anything to which he turned his mind. He marked on his zeal and enthusiasm for science. And also as a doctor, which he became after the university, um, he had, as he said, a great power of diagnosis. Balfour acted as um, a patron to William. Um, he recommended him to go on a voyage, um, a naval voyage as a surgeon. So he wrote to William Hooker at Kew, um, suggested that he brought um, William Nicholl with him. So he might have been a Darwin or a Huxley going out on expeditions overseas, um, botanizing and collecting while he was there. But sadly, illness and also the unexpected death of his father, Walter, and his sister um, intervened and he didn't actually go on that expedition. He was then sent out on another to India, um, so less um, exploratory, I, I imagine, um, but nevertheless, perhaps the start. But again, he, he fell ill and died um, in Alexandria en route. So the details that I've given you of, of his life are from Balfour in his obituary of William Nicholl in the Society's Transactions. So William Nicholl was just 23 when he died in 1859. Um, his father had died in 1858 and his sister who had also died around the same time must have been about 20. So John Walter Nicholl and his mother um, were the two left behind and at that time he was just 16. Um, the 1861 census um, tells us, um, so a couple of years later at 18, um, they were living together in Haddington Place um, on Leith Walk. Um, this wonderful photograph um, gives us a view of that um, from Carton Hill. Um, so I think Haddington Place is about um, here um, on the photograph. Um, and when Walter was there with his mother, um, he was working in Leith, so further down the road towards, as you can see, the, the port and quite industrial world that it was at the time. Um, and he was working there as a general merchant's clerk. That certainly would have been one use of his mathematical skills um, and knowing his future activity, it's a reminder of that um, slightly earlier generation, perhaps of business and accounting kind of astronomers that were very key to the foundation of London's um, Astronomical Society in 1820. Uh, men like Francis Bailey, Benjamin Gompertz, John Lubbock, um, who were accountants, businessmen, um, worked in um, uh, these sorts of banking, uh, these sorts of fields. Um, and this was seen as being very appropriate to the kind of astronomy that they did. It was an accounting um, kind of work. And this is echoed in um, John Walter Nichols' obituary, which suggests that his accurate business-like habits had allowed him particularly to contribute to the success of the Honolulu expedition. So being a clerk at AT, and I don't suppose um, John Walter Nichol was um, earning a great deal, um, but his mother as head of household was probably the one who was um, helping to sustain um, the family with again a live-in servant at the time. She was um, said in 1861 in the census to be a fund holder. Um, in the 1871 census, um, she is described as living on the interest of a railway share. So she's evidently um, all the family um, invested in railways at an opportune time and were, were able to live on that. Although by 1871, they'd moved to a relatively modest um, villa, Ruby Villa on Murray Street, which is now Sheen's Gardens. Certainly they had sufficient funds um, that when, um, quoting from his obituary, his mind led him to the study of scientific subjects and especially to that of astronomy. He had the means to gratify his taste. So there was enough money for him to give up working and to go, as it said, to spare neither time nor effort in trying to attain proficiency by attending lectures at the university. So in 1869, um, now aged 26, um, we find him at the university. He appears, um, for example, on the prize list for the first class of mathematics in that year. It was now a decade since his brother and his father had died. And I do wonder if he felt some sort of familial duty to kind of fill their places by turning to science, by not staying in business, but by um, helping to fulfill, obviously, the great promise that his brother was known to have um, had and that was cut short. Um, perhaps he felt he'd learned his business in Leith and he was ready to move on. Perhaps 
he now had acquired, um, he and his mother had sufficient funds to allow it to happen. Perhaps while in Huntington Place here, um, he'd spent a lot of time looking up at Carlton Hill um, and felt he wanted to be there. Um, so he arrived um, at the observatory um, as second assistant in December 1870. Um, so quite late in life, I guess, to have sort of turned his attention to a new field um, and very close really in date to the period that he, he ends up at um, uh, on the expedition. Uh, so the Astronomer Royal, Charles Piazzi Smythe, appointed him um, to replace Peter Williamson, who had been um, the first individual to become a second assistant. So that was a new appointment um, from around the, the mid 1860s. Nicol arrived, um, it was said by Smythe, strongly recommended from the Natural Philosophy Laboratory by Professor Tate. So he, like his brother, had a, a patron, a mentor at the university. This was Peter Guthrie Tate, who was Professor of Natural Philosophy at Edinburgh, known particularly for his work on thermodynamics. From 1870, Tate had reported on experiments that he'd done in that laboratory, the Natural Philosophy Laboratory, um, and he reported on them to the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And the first set of those um, had been published um, and had included experiments done by Nicol. So he appears in that as having um, done work on radiation at various pressures of the surrounding gas. Um, so he clearly moved himself on quite swiftly from just attending mathematics lectures um, and you know, had got himself stuck in, in, in the, the laboratory. At the observatory, he was appointed um, on a temporary basis, um, but in 1871, it was reported that he had acquitted himself so admirably that having passed um, two examinations for the civil service um, and then undergoing with credit a still further probation of six months at the observatory, he was permanently appointed. So much of the work that he was doing while he was at the observatory um, was focused on the reduction of previous observations by um, earlier Astronomers Royal uh, and he helped with the publication of the Edinburgh Star Place catalogue and ephemeris um, that came out in 1877 so that was one of the reasons for having this second um, assistant but he certainly must have also become familiar with the routines um, of observation while he was there. We also have a record um, from Smythe of um, Nicol and the first assistant, Alexander Wallace, um, assisting um, in some experiments as well in June 1871, which were on the spectrum of light passing through high pressure steam. Um, this followed on um, the work from Tate's predecessor at the Natural Philosophy Laboratory, um, James David Forbes, um, shown here in the the lecture theater of, of the laboratory there. Um, and they undertook this um, with the assistance of Alexander Sight, who'd had an engine works on Leith Walk, and Thomas Wheatley, who was a locomotive superintendent of the North British Railway. Given um, Nicholl's previous experience with the Natural Philosophy Laboratory um, and with experimental work, it seems quite possible that he was much more deeply engaged in this process than, than might sort of give us the, the the hint of it, it suggests that he was just there assisting um, but I wonder if he was you know quite engaged or perhaps even a, a sort of a driver for it um, the more so that we we learn that the engineer slight um, had lived in Haddington Place as well so the the two of them had perhaps been neighbours for a period um, when I was looking at, uh, into this, I found that Slight's father had been um, an engineer under Robert Stevenson on the Bell Rock, Bell Rock Lighthouse and then also um, became curator of models to the Highland and Agricultural Society of Scotland. Both of those things are, are very close to the heart of the collections at National Museum Scotland um, with its Northern Lighthouse Board um, collection and also those models uh, made by Slight must be there. So I, I got very excited and then realised, you know, Edinburgh is a small place. Everyone did know everyone. Everyone does still know everyone. Um, but it was very nice to see um, that accidental connection. Anyway, uh, back to Nicol. Um, he just arriving um, you know, at, at the observatory was nevertheless clearly keen to see and do more. Um, he wanted perhaps more experience um, of, of astronomy, perhaps wanted to see the world. His brother, of course, had gone out intending to go on expedition. Um, perhaps again, he felt the sort of the drive to do that too. So he resigned in 1873, um, just years later, to volunteer for the Transit of Venus expeditions. And there he was very much part of the team, so wonderfully collect, uh, captured in the um, Caricatures by Noble, which I see as a kind of group bonding exercise, something that, that kept the sort of group laughing and together and, and sharing um, while they were, were working together overseas. 
And I think also from those caricatures, we see the truth um, of the comment made in his obituary that he was, or his description, his genial and kindly nature combined with his excessive bonhomie rendered him a pleasant friend. And many of the associates of his earlier youth remember the good, true and frank spirit with which he was wont to enliven their frequent reunions. Um, so bearing that in mind, I just want to show you a few of the images from the caricatures that, that give something of this impression. Um, this is one of my, my favourite sets of images um, that give a, a wonderful idea of the kind of trials and indignities um, of work um, in slightly difficult circumstances. Um, computing while under attack from mosquitoes um, on one side um, and finding themselves, you know, on a what was sold in the press as a very kind of noble sort of um, expedition as mere screw cleaners, um, as it's described here. Um, some of this we also get in uh, Noble's, um, sorry, in, in Tupman's own journals as well. He recorded that when it became necessary to commence the computing, we found the mosquitoes so troublesome, it was almost impossible to do anything. Nicol presented a mass of sores over his face and hands, and Ramsden couldn't sit at the table five minutes. Um, the poor things, I do feel for them. Um, they ended up having to create a kind of cage that they could work in um, to, to keep the mosquitoes out. And Nicol does certainly seem to have suffered from the mosquitoes, um, and uh, Noble made some jokes on his um, behalf. Um, think it says that here he was thinking that knickerbockers would be good um, clothes for the climate, but found that it were good for the mosquitoes as well. They enjoyed that. Um, and then um, clearly, definitely a joke, um, he said, we hear he proposes trying the Highland costume. Um, and the, he says the mosquitoes heartily agree. Um, so that was probably a joke, but it certainly wasn't that Nicol um, ended up dancing a fling uh, while at the soiree um, of the house of the, the wife of the French consul in, um, in Honolulu. Um, and on the one side, we have the, the Irishman Johnson singing a comic song. Um, and on the other side, we have Nicol dancing a fling. Um, he's called here um, our Caledonian homme sérieux, um, a comment that's what part of an ongoing joke um, that, that Nicol, sorry, that Noble um, presents in his caricatures of contrasting the way that others, newspaper reports and so on, characterise them and the sort of the nobility of um, the, the job that they have um, with the experience of their, their lived reality. Um, we have, uh, again, a quote from a newspaper here, um, uh, talking about the three studious, thoughtful men, which was how the Illustrated London News had described Ransden and Nicol and Noble um, standing there um, on the right hand side, um, despite the fact that here there, the story is about them being really irritated by the frequent visits of a local amateur astronomer who kept interrupting them while they were at work um, in the, the uh, observing compound in Honolulu. Um, a similar thing happens in this um, image as well. Um, Nicol um, on the left there seems certainly to have enjoyed smoking and drinking. Um, I hope they weren't um, something that were, were what that contributed to his his early death. Um, but um, the whole group here is shown um, as lounging about um, and enjoying themselves um, underneath a quote um, in French from from a very heightened account about the intrepid explorers um, undertaking these transit expeditions, suggesting that perhaps, um, you know, those, for example, in Honolulu might fall victim to their ardent love of science in some fashion. Um, and clearly they're not in any mortal danger here, uh, Noble suggests. Um, so if these characters um, were a kind of bonding experience for the group, they're also very much a souvenir. And clearly when Noble gave them to the leader of the expedition, Tupman, at the end, it was as a, a, a souvenir of um, the experience. And we can see a kind of nostalgia for, the, um, for that almost immediately as it begins to come to an end um, while they were there. Um, so this is a sort of um, fantasized image of what ought to happen to the peers uh, after they have left. Um, and we have Tupman there standing astride the peers of the transit instrument um, looking, you know, triumphant. Um, and on the other side, we have um, Nickel being associated with that Altazimuth instrument um, and the uh, peers for that. Um, it says um, the sort of cod Latin um, on that, um, it's the for the altazimuth illustrissimo et covered with levels and microscopes um, so the sense that of the complexity of that instrument comes back again in his final sheet um, of the characters noble um, imagined where they all might be in the future so they were all together for this intense experience and then they all um, dispersed again um, probably uh, most of them not not um, to meet again 
Um, so we have um, Tupman at the top um, reducing, uh, uh, reducing the observations back in Greenwich. So this shows him at a desk, all of the volumes of observations um, to hand um, and a, a picture of Airy at the back there. So this is them um, at Greenwich. We have Forbes on a sledge there. He's, um, he did undertake an adventurous return through Siberia. So he made a real trip um, of what he was doing. Um, Ramsden beyond that is um, on board a naval vessel, this, this naval officer working with a mechanical sanding machine. Uh, Noble at the bottom is back to military drill. Um, he clearly didn't particularly relish that, although he made his career um, there and, and was promoted afterwards. Um, we have Johnson at the bottom um, being um, uh, standing for Tipperary, apparently speaking in favour of Irish home rule. Um, and then we have Nicol um, away down to Edinburgh apparently. Um, it says that he's, you know, he's gone to the house of the Astronomer Royal for Scotland um, at the top there. Um, I don't think this kilted figure can really be Smythe himself, um, but um, maybe this is how it was imagined by Noble. In fact, he wasn't. Um, so just to, to sort of uh, conclude by saying what happened um, to Nicol next, um, he had left his Edinburgh post, so he did not return um, back up to Edinburgh. Um, his a replacement had been appointed in 1874, so there was no job there for him, but he also clearly had other amb ambitions. One of the things he immediately did was um, set off um, to have a look at um, the uh, volcanoes um, that were on, um, on the island. Um, so immediately after finishing the whole suite of observations, Ramsden and Nicol together set off for the, the crater of Mauna Loa. Um, and uh, Nicol turned that um, sort of expedition, they did it at night so they could get a real sense of the, um, the lava and, and um, the whole um, experience. Um, he turned that into a short communication um, to the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which was read in their 1875-76 um, session. As you can see at the top, it was communicated by Professor Tate. So he obviously continued to be a connection and, and a um, potentially a um, patron to, to Nicol. Um, so he gives lots of description in this. It's mainly a descriptive piece um, talking about the sort of the paths and the descents and the general topography, what the types of lava and smoke and flares and so on. Um, there is a slightly alarming story of how a professor from Indiana managed to fall into a crack and had his hands severely cut and burnt, um, but survived to tell the tale, I think. Um, Nicol made a few observations. He suggested some interpretations about how the different um, craters and so on um, might have linked up, but it's not, not a very scientific paper, perhaps a marker um, of an intent to return um, to the topic, to return to Scotland, perhaps to become a fellow of the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which he, he wasn't at this time. Um, he, um, after this, um, returned to Britain, but not, again, not to Edinburgh, um, but as with all the expedition members, he, he went to Greenwich. Um, he stayed longer than many of them did, though. They all had to hand over their observations. They all had to establish their own personal equation. Um, but he stayed um, for some time afterwards and un undertook all of the reductions of the Station B Meridian transits. Um, Noble's journal, um, records him um, here. There's a, an underlining in red at the moment when he um, had um, here returned from Leaf uh, from Christmas on 3rd of January 1876. Um, and also 8th of June 1876, um, Tupman recorded that he received from Nickel, Mr. Nickel the final results for latitude of Honolulu. Um, so that's the line drawn under it. 1876, two years um, nearly, or well, certainly since they, they had set off um, to Hawaii, the experience was over um, for Nicol. But he then had more things to do. From Greenwich, he headed um, not to, again to Scotland, but to Leipzig. He studied there, um, according to his obituary, uh, under Professor Karl Bruns, who was the instigator and first director of the new observatory there. Um, so there had been one connected to the university. And then it was rebuilt in the 1860s away from the encroaching city um, and it was widely admired for the um, sort of architectural arrangements and the, the new instruments that were put in. Bruns himself focused on positional astronomy and longitude determinations particularly um, and these are also very clearly um, Nichols' real area of, of experience and expertise. I wonder if possibly he was there to learn from Leipzig's experience um, in order to consider what the removal and re-equipping of a, an observatory would be like. Was he going to bring back these lessons to Edinburgh? I don't know. 
Uh, while he was there, Nicol carried out an investigation of the orbit of uh, one of the 1877 comets, um, drawing on observations made, um, all of the European observations, and published in a um, very significant German periodical in 1878. This wasn't a particularly visually exciting um, comet. I don't know if you can see at the moment, I've got people's um, uh, pictures all sitting over where you can see um, comic um, Kodja, uh, which was visible in 1874, and they were able to observe while they were um, on the voyage to, to Honolulu. Um, so a marker perhaps um, with this paper of his intention to contribute um, to astronomy, um, not just in Scotland, but internationally. So at this point, he's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. He's had a communication published by the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He's had this paper in um, Astronische Nachrichten. Um, someone perhaps seriously developing his role within the world of science, um, he might perhaps have gone on to do much more, especially um, given that he had that natural philosophical as well as his mathematical and astronomical training. But sadly, we know he died. Returning to England, he was suddenly cut off in the prime of life by a pulmonary infection and died at Tynemouth on November 4th, 1878. His mother then was the sole survivor of the immediate family, and um, she lived on to her 90s, um, living in Newington towards the end of her life. And she'd been widowed by them for nearly 40 years and had lost all three of her children in their 20s and 30s. She seems to have reverted to her maiden name, Crozier, um, but didn't certainly forget the Nichols. Um, in her will, she left a bequest to the university. £2,000 um, was left in the memory of her son, John Walter Nicol, to endow an assistantship to the chair of natural philosophy. So just the kind of role that Nicol had held when he was there working under Tate. This became known as the Nicol Foundation, and it became a position offered to a deserving student um, who would work in the physical laboratory, and also, as it said, to um, give his whole, ta whole time in the promotion of the study of natural philosophy. I was delighted to discover that it still exists, the Nickel Foundation and the prize, um, and it's given out, it's rather smaller, perhaps in terms of the impact on an indiv individual's life, um, but I hope still a distinguished prize for undergraduate students with the highest marks in the School of Physics um, and Astronomy. I don't know if John Walter Nickel is known um, as the individual behind um, this prize, um, but I can now offer a great deal more context um, to the individuals who have received that prize over time. Um, certainly a lot of pictures for them to explore. So that's the story I, I wanted to give. Um, a story of a life and career initially shaped by Edinburgh's educational offer, the schools, the private teaching, uh, particularly this focus on mathematics that was in close connection with the university. Um, the university was open to people not just, you know, enrolled to get degrees, but, but individuals who could come and, and sit in lectures if they paid. Um, and also the range of scholarly societies, which we find the different members of um, the family being connected with. But I think we shouldn't forget also that Edinburgh was offering um, this kind of world of business mathematics that supported trade um, in places like Leith, and also the industrial engineering of railways and lighthouses and agricultural agriculture that provide context and resources. Um, they are the reason why someone like Walter Nickel could be a private mathematics teacher. Um, they're also the reason why experimental work um, could be supported financially. It's the railways that allowed Nickel to go and um, become a scientific figure. Um, and also the railways that offered experimental um, physics an opportunity to carry out some um, work on spectrums and so on. Not forgetting also those naval, military, imperial kind of contexts that um, underpinned government support for astronomy generally and the transit of Venus expeditions very specifically. So we have an individual who took and made the most of all these kinds of opportunities available, clearly for his own personal interests, also his sense of his family role, um, but became a servant of science, also indirectly of, of nation and empire as a result. Um, so if you want um, to look more at these images, and there's many more of them, um, do go along to Cambridge Digital Library. Um, you can just Google CDL and Transit of Venus and that will take you there and there's lots to explore. Um, also, um, an article that I wrote um, looking particularly at Noble and, and his caricatures and that expedition um, is currently free to access. Um, so there's no login for that. Um, anyone who's interested in that, there's lots of um, useful references to find out more as well. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you very much. If we can show our appreciation. Excellent. Um, a, a, a great story, full of local interest uh, and 
and international significance. Okay, some questions. Yes, we have some questions. Uh, Mark had the first one. Uh, the first pick, Mark, what was that? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Rebecca. That was really good. Very, very interesting and, uh, and great to, to hear someone um, from Edinburgh. You can hear all the, all the, the, the same places that, you, that we know today as well. So that's really, really good. Um, the very first picture, the one we used um, to, to advertise this talk and the next one, the, the newspaper, mm. the, the, the very interesting. I, I'm tying in the question from someone on YouTube as well. The, the illustration shows um, people looking through the telescopes at uh, the transit of Venus, um, would they not have been projecting it or did they have suitable solar filters in those um, days? The, the first picture particularly interests me. It's the first time I've ever seen a sort of historic picture of someone looking through a telescope, looking through a diagonal. In every other picture I've ever seen, you see someone looking straight through it. So um, that, that in itself is quite interesting. I, it, it may have been a Herschel wedge in those days, I suppose if it was, um, uh, looking at the sun, but did they have suitable filtering material in those days or how would they have done it? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. There, there was um, darkened glass. I mean, you know, it may, we may not consider it suitable in the sense of, um, you know, f fully safe now, but um, certainly um, observations were made, could be made um, that way. Um, you, you had them for sextants as well. You get sort of um, filters that could be brought across for those. And, and in the 18th century, to you, you would use perhaps smoke glass um, or whatever. So yeah, um, they, they would be looking at um, straight through it. The, the one who's not in that illustrated London news image is the photographer, of course, using a photoheliograph that is projecting onto a photographic plate, um, but the rest of them are looking um, directly, yeah. And, and, and is, would that have been a Herschel wedge or something looking at, 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 a, at a right angle through the telescope in the first picture? Um, I'm afraid I don't know. <laughs> um, it would depend on, I mean, there's several different instruments there. Um, I, I, I don't know it enough, I'm afraid. Well, I think we should ask our uh, Regis professor that question. Good idea. <laughs> He'll be able to answer it. Yeah, ask, ask me what? I thought, didn't Rebecca just answer everything completely clearly? What? Herschel Wedge, I didn't answer. <laughs> oh, no, no idea. No idea. <laughs> um, but you did mention that one of the chairs were in your office. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. The uh, the picture of Forbes in the lecture theatre. Uh, the, the tall chair he's sitting in. Uh, where, this is uh, not at the observatory, but when I was head of physics, uh, um, that, that chair was in my office and is now presumably in Jim Dunlop's office. And it's one of many things. Um, I can tell you this, Rebecca, if you promise not to pass it on to the appropriate people. One of a number of things squirreled away in the School of Physics and Astronomy that we're very careful not, not to tell the university collections people about. <laughs> Be very careful with them though. <laughs> yes. I'd like to see that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, quite, quite a lot of the instruments survive. Um, the Greenwich, um, so the National Maritime Museum collections include quite a lot of the instruments that, that came back and were then used at Greenwich and have now um, not that particular six inch because that ended up um, on a, um, a shipwreck. It went out again for the 1882 transit, um, but, but sank, um, sadly. But, but some of the others survived. So um, technical questions could be um, put towards Louise Devoy, the curator there, and <laughs> she might be able to tell you. Okay. John, you had a very quick question about Mrs. Crozier. Yeah, I was, I've been reading this book, if you can see it. Um, okay, yes about the um, exploration of the Antarctica and Arctic by um, the ships Erebus and Terror. Mm. Of course, Crozier was one of the main men of the expedition. I wonder if he was related to Mrs. Crozier. Is it um, the... Yeah, well, she, she was, um, so Crozier was her maiden name um, yes. and she was born in the early 19th century. I, I don't know. Um, I haven't done that bit of genealogy. I think she was born in Scotland. I don't know. So the, the sense might have been as well. I'm not sure because a lot of them were on that expedition. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's an interesting thought. I'll see if I can join any dots there. Yes, okay, thanks. Uh, Douglas Kerr had a question about the materials for the solar filtering. Did you get that answered, Douglas? Yes, thank you. That's been answered already. Okay, cheers. Uh, Jim? Just saying thank you. Jonathan Smith? Yes. 
Yes, my question was about, um, did I remember, I don't remember right, that, that he was doing um, experiments on the infrared, infrared transmission through steam. And I was wondering, did, would, did they give a reason why they were doing it or was it just curiosity because it's there? Um, I, I I haven't had a chance to look um, deeply into to that side of things. Yeah, I mean I've I sort of this has been a new bit of research um, that I've that I've sort of started and see what came up. So I haven't managed to pursue what um, they were doing beyond beyond the, the title. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Further work to be done. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Over to you, Mark. Are there YouTube questions? Huh? I, th I think I, I included the YouTube question. It was about um, the, the material for the filter as well. Um, I, I have another another question um, about Nicol. Is there any information that he was actually interested in astronomy before he did this, or he just actually had um, the mathematical and technical skills to do it? I mean, it, it seems like it was a, a way of making making some form of income. I can't imagine today you'd think, um, I need some income, I'll come and become a professional astronomer. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I suspect he probably wasn't thinking that either. I don't think the second assistant at the observatory was paid a great deal. I suspect he could have made much more money, you know, remaining within his business context um, in Leith. I, I think he did it out of genuine interest in this, this sense um, that, that clearly he and his brother had been brought up with that this was, you know, the right kind of thing to do and that it was... Um, contributing something and was a sort of a more noble kind of um, work than, than others. Um, so, um, I mean, I suspect he wouldn't have been content sort of staying as, as an assistant's kind of salary uh, when they were, and he volunteered for the um, transit of Venus. They were, they were paid sort of expenses and, and, you know, sort of maintained while they were on expedition. But again, that's not about making money, certainly. Um, so I think he, I think he had ambitions to be a man of science. Um, and, you know, as with many in the 19th century, you only really got to do that if you had sufficient funding behind you. Um, not, not to say that's entirely gone away today. <laughs> uh, Re Rebecca, if I could jump in there, you're starting to answer what I was going to ask next. I was just going to ask, you know, what would a, the assistant astronomer have been, been paid? But, I mean, more precisely, what, what was the status of that position? Was it seen as a professional stepping stone or was it a sort of, seen as a permanent dog's body position you know or what, what, what was the status of a job like that um that's a really interesting question i think it's a moment of it's around that period that you get a change so he is his replacement was someone who was a graduate so that's new i don't think previous assistants had been um and at greenwich too you start to get um Certainly first assistants. Um, I mean, there, there are other people I know. I think Daniel Balsecki is watching on YouTube and he would be able to give you all the ins and outs of the 19th century um, assistants and, and their status. But um, they, it's certainly um, in say in the 18th century, it had been a role that you would come in at a pretty early stage of your career. It would give you a training. You were paid really not very much, um, but it might give you the opportunity to make your career in other ways. And of course, there weren't many opportunities for people with mathematical skills, um, observational skills. They ha people had to kind of make careers from a, a range of different, you know, they would do some computing, they'd do some observing, they'd do some expeditionary work, and you could kind of build a piecemeal career that way. Um, but it was quite difficult to get. Um, teaching was, was often, you know, the best way of getting a sort of, um, a decent income um, with these kind of skills. Um, but clearly um, it was undergoing a bit of a, a sort of status change. Um, and by the sort of end of the 19th, 20, uh, into the 20th century, um, it, it's much more of a career path that's um, that's available. And, and it seems being not just a kind of hands-on job dog's body kind of role, but, you know, actually genuinely contributing sort of scientific effort. Mm. Uh, there's an observation from ACD. Sorry, ACD, I can only see the top of your head, so I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Why? Hi. Would you like to talk about the uh, your view on the STEAM experiments? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, and certainly CPS and others did uh, experiments to try and simulate the rain band. Uh, mm. so-called, which they thought was a, a band that appeared in the cell refracted cell spectrum. 
uh, the presaged, uh, presaged rain. Uh, and um, in order to simulate atmospheric conditions before it was going to rain, um, they did observe, observe spectra through pipes full of steam. Um, again, apparently this was done in, in <coughs> Paris um, particularly, but um, I think Piazzi Smythe was involved as well. Mm. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, what they were doing was something related to that. Uh, that sounds not a guess. That sounds right. There's only a very brief report of it in the sort of uh, annual report for the observatory, which is where I got the, the detail of Nicole being involved. Um, I'd have to, that sounds also like what Forbes would have been interested in, yeah. um, I think too. But yeah, um, I, I could, could do a bit more work on that. But thanks. You're welcome. Jonathan, you had a comment there as well. Do you want to add more? Uh, no, no, that, that answers it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and, and John? You were asking about uh, magnetic measurements? Yeah, yeah, in that book I was just showed you, um, in the 1840s, of course, and 1850s, when they were um, exploring the Arctic and the Antarctic, they were very heavily into carrying out magnetic measurements wherever they went. Everywhere they went, they stopped and built a magnetic observatory. I wondered if they were still doing that by the time of the transit or whether they'd, um, whether it become less important with the improvements in navigation. Um, it, there was the the period called the Magnetic Crusade um, yeah. of the 1830s and 40s, which was when there was a real push um, to, to understand these things. I think that had somewhat faded off, um, they, but but hadn't gone away. I mean, in the 1860s, Airy was um, experimenting with with magnets, particularly trying to work out the sort of relationship between magnets and iron ships. And of course, the more iron ships there were, the more problematic um, having your um, onboard uh, compasses would be. Um, so that that work continued. I mean, the, the magnetic observatories um, continued their work. Um, so that, that push had happened and then sort of the work continues rather than, yes. than going away. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Bruce. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make some points about uh, Nichols' work at uh, Carlton Hill mm, thanks. to add to what you were saying earlier because I've read through the minutes of the Carlton Hill situation. When Henderson came to Carlton Hill in 1834, his whole being was to do with making really accurate star maps. And he hired Alexander Wallace, uh, Wallace whom he then put on the uh, transit telescope to do the time service. And he did all of the measurements on the mural circle, the lot, lock, stock and barrel. Hmm. Uh, in fact, he did a few measurements on the transit to check what uh, Wallace was doing, but Wallace never did anything on the uh, uh, mural circle. So they were building up astronomical atlases per se with the 60,000 measurements they did between them. Wallace went on to be the only person, I believe, to ever do the time service in Edinburgh because he went right on until retirement in about 1880 um, under CPS. Yeah. And then when, at the time when the time service was not needed because they had telegraph wires. Now, what happened was when um, CPS came to Edinburgh after Henderson died in 1844, CPS says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make atlases. And what he said he was going to do was to find out the apex of the sun's motion, which he went on to try to do later in the 1880s. And he, when he brought out the two last mod, um, big, huge volumes of uh, the observ observation series. But what he did was um, he left Alexander Wallace doing the time service and he hired firstly Williamson, who you mentioned, and then Nickel to do the uh, mural circle measurements. He wasn't interested in building maps and they did very few measurements at all. But, but Williamson and Nickel were the two people who did measurements on the... Um, mural circle post uh, Henderson. I always think that should be called the Henderson room <laughs> because Henderson uniquely used that to make star atlases, where mm. it's stellar atlases, where the people who came later didn't do that. I don't know why he had them on there, but they weren't doing very many measurements. Okay, thank you. Yes, I've got a lot to learn about this observatory. <laughs> yeah. Read the minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. The, uh... Randall, did you want to say that that's a good question? Would you like to, uh, you? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking, which is I've just been reading um, 
Richard Proctor's Essays in Astronomy from 1874. And in 1870, he published an article in which he was very enthusiastic about the possibility of using photography in order to investigate the transit. And that, as I understand it, was um, really quite a new idea in those days that um, he'd just been reading about the use of photography in the solar eclipses of 1860 and 1868. And he's looking forward to 1874 and says, doubtless in 1874, astronomers will apply photographic methods to the transit. It's quite a new idea. But he then goes on to say, it seems to me that photographic observation of the coming transit merits a full preliminary inquiry of whether Halley's or Delisle's method of direct observation is better. And according to the answer to that question, which he follows in the most astonishing detail in these um, diagrams of the Earth, it made a great deal of difference which observing site you chose. So my question really was, do we know very much about how and why they ended up in Hawaii? and whether that was influenced directly by the introduction of photographic techniques alongside um, direct observation through solar filters? That's a very good question. Um, and I don't know the answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, and which, which certainly, I'm sorry, it's, yeah, it's been a while since I, I did that, that side of um, thinking about it. I don't know if anyone else knows. Um, and they weren't following Halley's approach, certainly. Um, so it was about the timing rather than the, um, the measurement. Um, and that, that related not just to photography, I think, but also um, the other equipment that, that they had. So I'm sure that the location was chosen with, with that approach and method in, in mind. Um, but yeah, I don't know where else it, it might have been. Um, certainly Hawaii was was very well placed for, for getting the whole thing and both the, the ingress and egress um, on the yeah. day. Yeah. No, he's very interesting about whether you go for ingress or egress or centering. Mm -hmm. And he produces a list at one point of, it seems to me, virtually everywhere in the world, according to which. Yeah. <laughs> Which, which of these you want to choose? I mean, the range, it's an extraordinary range from Hawaii, which does appear up there, but also all the way down through Bombay, Calcutta. And he really looks at the whole world. So I, I, I think I was really more interested in the general fact that this is one of the first moments in which photography actually begins to compete with yeah. direct observation. And I mean, I'm particularly interested in that nobody took a picture of a comet until 1881, so that the idea of using solar pictures obviously came first because the sun's quite bright. And it's interesting to see how the two competed with each other and gradually alighted into to one mm. set of operations. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were terribly excited about the possibility of using photography, yeah. not yeah. surprisingly. Um, and the, the hope was that this would solve all the sorts of problems that had come up in the 18th century, the black drop effect and yes. um, you know, yeah. other issues yeah. with timing or um, problems between different choice of instruments and, and, and so on. Um, but it was much less successful than they had hoped um, yeah. for a number of reasons. Partly yeah. the stability of the, the photographic emulsion itself was yeah. not necessarily yeah. allowing something that was yeah. as fixed and um, you know, able to, to measure as they'd, as they'd hoped. Yeah. Um, so in the end, um, I think certainly one of the um, results that was come up with, they essentially discounted all of the photographic um, results. Um, it was still a problem in 1881 and 1882, which was, of course, the second transit of Venus, to the extent that um, the French philosopher Henri Bergson intervened to say, you're wasting your time. There is no such thing as a precise moment. Stop arguing about how you <laughs> you're actually have a mistaken concept of, of time itself. Yeah. So it was a very interesting moment. And of course, um, in, in that decade, they also begin the Cut to Ciel um, project as yes. well. So yes. it's probably really yes. into its, its yes. role, yeah. Yes. Thank Can you. I just come in there? I, I've been looking at the map of the 1874 transit and uh, the best place to go to see the whole transit would have been somewhere around the longitude of Japan or Australia or New Zealand. Uh, mm. Hawaii would have seen the sun set before the yeah. uh, Venus left the disk of the sun. So they just mm. saw the beginning. Yeah. And uh, I, Looking at that transit, I understand Britain had, or the UK had five expeditions. Hawaii was one. 
There was another one to New Zealand, another one to somewhere in uh, the Kerguelen Islands, which is far south of India, and another one to Cairo. The Cairo was at the other end of the eclipse, would have seen this uh, Venus leaving uh, the disk at the very end of the transit. Yeah. I think the idea is if you've got places in, in lots of parts of the world, then you can work out the parallax because of the difference in timing of the eclipse yeah. from these different points. Exactly. So right. Hawaii was, was sort of the eastern most of the site that Britain sent expeditions to. Yeah, no, ap apologies. Yeah, um, the, the ingress was clearly what they were really, really commenting I mean, and what they could see, you're quite right. Um, and uh, yeah, Noble makes a number of bad jokes about ingress and egress and, you know, accelerated ingress and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, <laughs> if you go and have a look at those, you can see. And um, they clearly talked about these words a lot. And he, Noble himself was not an astronomer. He was he had a military career, but he was, you know, a trained observer. Um, and, and adopted all the lingo and, and the sort of um, the persona for, for that period. Thanks. Okay, uh, John, you made another comment about the filters. Do you want to? Yeah, it's just yeah. basically saying that if they had photographic film, of course, or photographic plates in those days, you can use a black photographic plate um, as a solar filter fairly safely in those days because they all had silver in them. Mm. Can't do it now because it's um, a dye process and there's no silver to absor absorb the infrared. So that could have been another choice for a filter. Yeah. Um, yes, I haven't. I haven't looked into the instrumentation in that depth to know to know just what they were using. Um, but an interesting question. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a discussion of it in um, somewhere in some of the papers. Yeah. <laughs> and ACD has a couple of comments for Randall. Hello, can you hear me again? We can. Uh, yeah, uh, just a, well, a couple of comments. I'm not sure which which of the methods you mentioned um, they settled on that Proctor was talking about, but a slightly scurrilous story about Proctor, who was a, a, a somewhat argumentative individual, was uh, effectively forced to stand down as editor of monthly notices for being unduly partisan about... Um, the choosing sites for the eclipse expeditions in the in the run up to them, um, uh, which uh, 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 um, is an entertaining story. Um, and the other point was just about the photographing comets. Well, you can't. You, it was completely impractical with nineteenth century emulsions to photograph the faint tails of comets until they started introducing the uh, dry gelatin plates in about 1880, I think, from memory, um, because b before that you just couldn't make long exposures and without long exposure, you don't get the, don't get the tail. So that, that's why the, certainly the photographs of the tails of comets were, were later. Mm. And the same applies to, to nebulae, of course. Which is why you still get the drawings. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, that's the uh, qu questions. If there's any, any last, Anxious question or comment? There's something, a comment on YouTube saying there was a pressure from Warren de la Rue and the Board of Visitors of the Royal Observatory at Greenwich in 1871 to add a photographic arm to the expedition from oh, okay. Bamsall. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, another great champion of um, new approaches, new techniques, um, and, and on the Board of Visitors, so sort of able to um, exert that kind of pressure. I think a, a lot of them fell out over various things, though. Um, Proctor and Airy, I think, fell out over kind of the question of funding for scientific research, um, which Airy was kind of against, um, interestingly. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much, Rebecca. This is a, we know it's a strange sort of environment to deliver these talks that we're, we're all having to get used to. But uh, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. And if everybody can share their appreciation again. That... Well, and, and, and now we know you are local, uh, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you very much for, you know, giving me a reason to start, you know, getting into my, my Edinburgh history and stuff. And as you can see, there's plenty more that I need to follow up on. So I, I look forward to joining you again and, and seeing the, the instruments you have in your cupboards and that sort of thing. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and thank you, Andy, for doing the intro.
And okay. with that, so I hope to see you all on the uh, the fourth of um, the fourth of December for the next full meeting. And um, 